You guys, that worship was so good. Um, and, and I, like the Holy Spirit is here right now, and I hope you recognize that. I hope, I, like, and I hope this message isn't just an interruption of that. I want to come alongside the Lord because um, God's moving. Let me pray one more time. Jesus, we, we just thank you so much that you're a good Lord, that we get to pursue you, that you made all of this possible. We can come up here and just press in, and I pray that your spirit would, would really be in this place and moving and, and uh, moving in all the ways that your Holy Spirit does, God. Lord, we, we want to know you're here and we want to experience you, but more than anything, we want to um, just be pushed to, um, in, into a deeper level of worship and obedience and understanding of who you are so we could respond uh, the way we need to respond. Holy Spirit, just cover this place right now. Love you, Lord. Thank you. Um, you guys, as Danny said, my name is David. I, um, I have the privilege, have had the privilege of coming to camps like this for a long time. I have no clue how many camps I've been to. It's somewhere around the 40s. Um, I love these camps. And uh, if I didn't have a family at home, I'd be at both of them. It's not easy to get away from the family for a long time. Um, I miss them. Um, my son this morning, Thatcher, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. My son, I guess, was praying at the brick breakfast table, and he said, uh, Mommy, I'm praying that you and Daddy have a lot more babies. I don't know where that came from, but, sorry, my bad. Uh, but my son prays for the most random stuff like that. The other day he was driving home um, with my wife and he goes, mom, what type of car does Jesus drive? And we're, and we're still trying to figure that one out, how to explain to him and break it to him that Jesus didn't drive a transformer because that, you know, they're half cars, but he'll, we'll get there so, someday. Um, but, uh, one of the weirdest things about being a dad is potty training your kid. It, yeah, not, not woo. I'm sorry. No. In fact, part of me doesn't want you guys ever to go through it, but the fallen part of me is excited that you guys have to go through it one day when you have kids. Like, yes suckers. Like, right? And here's the deal with potty training. I'm going to keep pushing this. It's, ugh, but with potty training, my wife and I, we, we came up with a plan and we, um, we have to come up with incentives to get my son to go pee and poo in the big boy potty, right? So every three days, we have to change the incentive. He's, he's a little kid. He's you know, every three days, mix it up. So whether it's like you get a special treat one day or you get a transformer another day or something, we, we always have to give them incentives as if not walking around with a giant turd in your pants is not incentive enough. But thankfully, he's all potty trained. He's been potty trained for a while and I'm, I'm stoked. Um, but here's what's crazy. We are not much different than my three-year-old son when it comes to incentives. Like, we have to have incentives to do things. Whether it's going to work, we have to get money, we're going to school because we get grounded, and maybe career and grades and all of that, but mostly because we don't want to get arrested. Um, we, like, we have incentives on every single thing we do. Uh, and, and even getting kids to come up here to camp like, this is an amazing experience, but we have to, like, especially at Youth Venture, there's some kids that I have to bribe to get them up here because they need some sort of incentive to, in order for them to do something. And the, probably the dumbest story that I have about this, I have three brothers, and uh, so we've gotten into a lot of trouble growing up. My older brother once wanted these sunflower seeds that I had, and I had a couple packs of gum. So in order to get those, we dared him to go streaking. <laughs> and streak, like, streaking is stupid. I don't know the punishment, but I'm pretty sure you go to juvie or like 
If you're under 18, if you're my age, I'm going to jail. I'm a sex offender. I'm like, all these things don't go streaking. It's not worth it. But for a pack of sunflower seeds and bubble gum, it was worth it to my brother. So sure enough, middle of the day, growing up, he has running shoes on, and that's it. And he goes streaking down our street, middle of the day, like 12 houses down to the bottom, all the way back up. Being a really kind brother, I locked him out of the house. <laughs> Being a really smart older brother, he brought with him keys and he got back in. But my brother did that. He risked like a lot. I don't even know. He's, he would be in big trouble if you get caught streaking. I don't know what the punishment is. It's not worth sunflower seeds at all. But we, do, we will go to to crazy lengths if we're willing, if the incentive is right for us, right? But the sad part is this. If the incentive is not worth it, we're also not willing to do much, right? Even if it's good for us, even if it's right, if there's not some, something out of it that we could say that we received, we're often not willing to do it. We're not willing to carry out whatever it is that, that we're supposed to do. So today I want to talk about that a little bit. And I want to ask you a hypothetical question. Would you worship God if heaven was not guaranteed? I want you to think about that. It's, not, it's hypothetical. It's not a real situation. But would you worship God if no blessings were promised other than just friendship? with the Lord. Think about that. The only thing that you would receive is, is what you receive during devotions, that, that worship, that, that relationship, that friendship there. But after that, and, he, and we know that promised blessings, all that, those are already conditional, right? If, if you go and you, you sin and act like a crazy whatever, like you're not going to get all the blessings that the Lord has for you. But even if you followed God and worshiped him and honored him, and those things were just, you might get them or you might not. Would you worship God? Think about that for a second. Would you press in? Would you be honest? Would you be kind? Would you be loving? Would you be generous? If it was just because the Lord said you should and, and no other reason beyond that. And I'm not the first person to ask this question, is friendship with God enough? Is friendship with the Lord enough beyond anything else that he has to offer? In fact, there's an entire book in the Bible we're going to get into that, that delves into this. It's a book of Job, right? Job, Job, that, that book in there. Let me give you some background on Job. First three chapters, pretty dang cool. Last three chapters, pretty dang cool. How many of you have ever read the entire book of Job? You guys, you know, it is it's slightly torturous. Like the, the middle of the book, I feel bad saying this, it's God's word, but it's like, do you, Job's friends come show up and they're stupid and they just gab and gab and you want to punch them in the face and you're like, shut up. And Job, so middle of the book of Job, you need to get through it. You need to read it, but it's not easy. Well, we're going to get into this question that God has for us, and we're going to start right at the beginning of Job. I want to read Job 1.1, 1, 1, if you could put it up. Thank you. And there was a man in the land of Uz whose name, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep. That's ridiculous. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke, which really means, of oxen, which means 1,000 oxen, 500 female donkeys, I don't know how many dude donkeys, and very many servants. In fact, it's said that he probably had at least 300 servants, and that this man was the greatest of all people in the East. You guys, this guy was crazy. In all of the Middle East, he said, the, the Bible says he was the greatest. Imagine what it would take for you to be considered the greatest man in all of California, or woman in all of California. What would that take? 
That'd be insane, right? Millions, probably, I don't know, 25 million people, and you're the greatest, or just the greatest person in all of San Diego. What would you have to accomplish to be called that? The greatest person in all of Lakeside. All right, that's not much. Um, so San Diego, San Diego. I live in Lakeside. I love Lakeside. I, my neighbors have cows, not that many sheep, but they have it. Livestock, it's pretty awesome. Other than this one time, they had this rooster, but it's dead now. Sweet. Uh, that thing was annoying, right? So the Bible says that Job was the greatest man in all the East. And I want you to picture that if you have 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 1,000 oxen, all of 300 servants, imagine how stinking wealthy you were, but also the influence, the amount of, of just where you move things, the amount of trade and influence you had in the entire region, Job was living the life. And he had tons of sons and daughters, so he was willing to pass those on. He was all set. He was good. But more than anything, God said in verse 1 that he was blameless and upright. I don't want you to miss this. If God gives you any compliment. Like God could say, hey, David Matrenga, he's an all right dude. And I'm gonna be stoked. I'm gonna be like, God said I'm all right. <laughs> right? Like, I, I'm, no joking aside, like if God even says anything about me, like directly, David Matrenga is, like even if it's like probably not even that good of a compliment, I'm gonna be so excited. But the Lord said that Job was blameless and upright. And more than all of his possessions, more than all of his wealth, more than all of his influence, that has to mean more than all of that. That the, the living God called him blameless and upright, recognizes that he walks in righteousness and honor and integrity. What would the Lord say about you? What would the Lord, and, and the Bible says a lot about you, if you're reading it. Some good and some not so good. I'm in there too. But you specifically, the life that you're living, the faith that you're walking out, what does the Lord have to say about you? I want you to think about that today. But unfortunately for Job, things didn't stay like this. Let's read it. Let's pick it up in verse 6. It says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down it. And in the original language, there's a sense of urgency when, the, when Job says that. And I love that because he knows his time is limited, right? Victory has already been won. But in verse 8, we pick up and it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? And if Job could have heard that, he probably would have been like, God, please don't bring me up. Like, I don't, like, in, anything else, call me blameless and upright somewhere else, but don't, like, shh, God, what are you doing? He says, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God? and turns away from evil. And here's where things get interesting. Verse nine says, Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for no reason? Think about that. Does Job fear God for no reason? Satan goes on to say, have you not put a hedge around him in his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed him with the works of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Because this entire book, I don't want you to miss this. If, if you're tired, sit up for a second, breathe, take a big breath. Don't miss this. This entire book revolves around this one verse in verse nine. Does Job fear God for no reason? And what, what Satan is saying is, God, you're not that big of a deal. The only reason Job worships you and follows you is because all that you've done for him, because of your blessings. 
You strip those away, and there's no way that he's going to follow you. Satan's saying, God, you actually aren't that great. All you can do is give great things. But you, when it comes down to just who you are, you're not much. There's not much between me and you. And he goes on in, to say, you strip everything away. You're not worth following. That's what Satan's accusing God of. What do you guys think about that? Is Satan right there? Of course he's not right, right? We all know like Satan can't be right. But in your life, where would you stand if, if that question was asked you? Does David fear God for no reason? Right? I remember um, there was this friend in junior high. He, he was a big fan of Lincoln Park. Any Lincoln Park fans out there? Thank you. I loved Lincoln Park. In junior high, now junior high granted, might have been like 15 years ago for me, so uh, a little less. I'm getting up there. But I could still sing every word to some of their songs, right? Like I was going over this message in the back, and I'm like, one thing, and you don't know why. It doesn't even matter how hard you try. Keep that in mind. I design no, I'm going to stop. Right? Like I could do it, and it took me... It took me listening to that CD a while to get that wrapped down. He gets pretty quick there, but I got it down, right? And I know that song. I love Linkin Park. I knew all of their stuff. I knew their, like, each band member's name and what they played and all of this. And my friend in school, he, it was his birthday, and he was going to go to the concert. And by friend, I mean, like, I kind of knew him. But he was going to go to this concert. And he was going to take a few friends. So I was going to be one of those friends, right? Like, it was just going to happen. So I did whatever I could for a certain amount. I don't know if it was weeks or, or I don't remember. It was in junior high. But I did everything I could to be one of those three that he was taking to this concert. And I, I was like, I memorized what things he liked. And I hung out with him at break. And I did everything because Linkin Park concert was worth it. Right? The incentive was worth it. But guess what? I didn't really care about the dude. And, and that's like an absolute jerk move. Definitely. Didn't, I mean, saying that, I feel bad. But it's the truth. I didn't, my friendship with this guy, I was in the friendship for the Lincoln Park tickets. And so I did everything I could and I was acting it out but it wasn't because I wanted to be his friend. It wasn't about the dude. And here's what's cool, later on, we actually became good friends. And here's what's sad, I don't know what happened, but nobody ended up going to that concert. I'm still a little sad about it today, so. But the, the point I wanna bring is this. I, I was in the friendship because it made sense, right? It, it, I was just doing it because I wanted to get something out of it. And, Satan here is saying, Job, you're in this. You're in this friendship with God for the benefits that he has for you. You're in this friendship for the blessings. You're in the friendship because God has made you rich and influential and famous, and you're the greatest guy in the East because God's blessed you. But if he takes that all away, you're not gonna worship him. He goes on to say this, John Hoffman would say that Job is a spiritual mercenary. You guys know what a mercenary is? I have a definition up here. It's someone who works or acts merely for money or other rewards. Hired to serve in a foreign army, or, or the noun is a professional soldier hired to serve. You guys, mercenaries are still alive and well today. In fact, in San Diego, there is a private military organization that our government hires to help them do some like pretty gnarly stuff because they have, they're really trained. They're mostly like ex, like Navy SEALs and stuff like that. They have tons of really good weaponry and the government knows that they could just pay these people and the job's gonna get done. That's crazy, right? That we still have that in America today. There are mercenaries and all they do is they're willing to fight and put their lives on the line because the price is right. They're willing to, the, the price is worth it for them. 
And, and saying, saying here to Job, Job, you're nothing more than a spiritual mercenary. God is giving you what price he's willing to pay, 3,000 whatever and 7,000 sheep and all of this. And that price is right, so you're willing to, to give your life to him. That's it though. You're in it for what you're getting out of it. And that sounds crazy, but we do a lot of the same things. Half of us go to Costco for the samples, right? We're just going to get one. The entire idea of Santa Claus is just because we're selfish. Like Santa Claus is a joke, if you think about it. Like, yeah. No, but the idea, no, clearly the dude is, but the idea behind it, imagine explaining to your three-year-old Santa Claus, and it's just, it's foolishness. And, and thankfully, my wife and I were, were teaching them all about St. Nick and this really real and awesome dude. But Santa Claus is a joke. But then if we think about our spiritual walks, I want you to think about why you go to church. Are you in it to pursue God or are you in it because church is a place where you can find friends and where you can find sympathy and and you can get a break from your guilt. You know, church can be a place where um, you get charity. And those things aren't bad. Like, it's good to find friends at church. In fact, it's the best place to find friends, right? And it's good to, re- to go to church and feel better about yourself if you're doing it in the right way. There's some problems there, too. But I know a lot of people who have left church because their friends, like something went haywire there. Or they left church because they no longer felt like they were receiving what they needed to to get. Is that what church is primarily about? I hope not. I hope that if every one of my friends leaves, I could still be at church because God hasn't changed. And I hope you're in the same position. I hope if things get weird because this one person does this one thing or you get offended because this one boy does this thing or this one girl, I hope that you recognize that God is still the same God and that's why we go to church. Or is it? That's something you have to ask yourself. So my next question is this, what is your price? What's your, what is the incentive for you to stay or, or rather, what's the incentive for you to leave? Because this whole thing can get flipped on its head. You could be the greatest athlete or the greatest musician. You could be the, the most intelligent or the most attractive. What is the price? What is the incentive that'd be worth it for you to fall away? And no, of course not. We would never fall away. If someone said, I'll give you a million dollars to curse God and walk away from the church. Heck no. Or if someone puts a gun to your head and says, hey, just renounce the Lord. No, we're not gonna do that. But if a movie comes on that we know we shouldn't watch, but it's funny, are we getting up? Right? Or if we need to ask someone for forgiveness, but that's awkward and it's weird and I, it's going to make me and I have to like put my pride down and surrender, are, are we asking that person for forgiveness? And there's so many different areas where, where the price to not follow God, well, it's enough for us. Why do we worship God is my question today. Why are you following the Lord? Satan says, Most of us just do it because God gives us cool things. Is God enough to be worshiped for his own sake? And is knowing God its own reward? I have a lot of breaks in this message because I want you to really think about that. I'm gonna answer it the best I can, but you're gonna have to, play your part too in in thinking about that. So Satan's first challenge was, hey, Job, you're not full of integrity. You're just here because the price is right. You're a spiritual mercenary. And his second attack was, God, you're not that big of a deal. You're actually not that great, but you can give great things. 
So this is what happens. God says, fine, my servant Job, do what you want. Let, let, let's read this. Uh, verse, I believe, 12. And the Lord says the same, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and he said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabaeans, whoever they are, fell upon them and took them and struck them down with the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have left to and escape to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God, like what the heck, fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking while they're in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck four corners of the house. Think about that. That doesn't make sense. And it fell upon the young people and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. He didn't have anything. And this is where the test really stands. Richard Wormbrandt was this pastor who was stuck in a, a Romanian communist prison for 14 years. He said those 14 years were the greatest years of his life in regards to his relationship with the Lord. He says, if you're an atheist or if you're a Christian and you haven't faced adversity, you don't really know what you believe. Because it's easy to believe something without adversity. But when the testing comes, then you'll know. Job lost everything. His wealth, gone. His servants, and you know he had relationships with those servants. He knew them. He depended on them. They were gone. They were all dead. His sons and his daughters were gone. And in the middle, in, in the moment, 30 seconds passed, maybe a minute, and everything went from being perfect to nothing was the same. How would you respond to that? Job said, it says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he, he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. What the heck? You guys, it's hard for me to face any adversity and not be like, what's going on? Hey, God, how you doing? Just, do you see that red light? Right? Or, hey, God, what's going on? Do you see this, like, this bill just came in and, you know, you said you'd bless me and it's a, it's a big bill. Or, or do you see that I've been sick and my family's been sick? Or did you see that this didn't go the way I wanted it to? And on and on and on. And it's so easy for us with the smallest thing to just start questioning the Lord. And Job lost everything all that he had, all his wealth, all his influence, all his authority, and all of his family. And he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. And unfortunately, that it goes on. Because Satan, it says in verse uh, 7, no, I'm sorry, did we, um, can you go to the next part, just the next verse? It says, Satan went out. 
with, from the presence of the Lord a second time, and he struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, and he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. I want, just pause there. Can you take that down? I want you to think of this. He finds a piece of broken pottery from what must have looked like a war zone all around his land. And he's covered in blisters, in pain, in agony, not to mention he just lost everything that he had. And he's scraping the blisters off his skin with a piece of pottery. You can't get into a worse position. Everything about his life is terrible. And as he's scraping off painfully these sores and every, it's just gross. He says, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's go up back, verse nine. It says, uh, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. And he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin. God took it all away. Well, Satan did. God, God allowed him to. And Job worshiped the Lord. He sat there in agony and pain. He sat there in torment and, and weeping over his kids and you worship the God that we can serve today because that God never changed. He was the same God and, and he was worthy to be worshiped even if everything was gone. And this camp's about refuge. And my question for you, and, and John did a great job in asking this last night, is what is your refuge found in? Because if it's in possessions, if it's in things, then what happens when those things fall away? What happens when they're no longer there? What do you have left to take refuge in? If we take refuge in the Lord and in his name, then there is nothing that can ever change or shake that. Let me say that again. In your place, if your grades fail and if your family fails and if your future career that you want to go into fails, if you're an athlete and you get hurt, if you're a singer and you lose your voice, if you're, you're planning on being an actress and something bad happens and you, you can't dance or sing or whatever it is, if you are hoping to be an engineer and you can't go to school because someone in your family falls sick, if the list can go on and on and on. If all the things that could happen go wrong? Is your refuge in those things or is it in the Lord? And is God worthy to be worshiped even if that happens? I can stand up here and I can tell you he is. Because I can tell you that our God is holy and he's unlike anything, anything at all that you can know and experience here on earth. It, even the love that we experience, you can't know love apart from God because God is love. You can't know mercy and righteousness because God embold, embodies those things so completely. So we only get a glimpse, a little taste of how good our God is and how loving he is. God is worthy to be worshiped for all those reasons. God is worthy to be worshiped alone because he saw that us fallen sinners, wicked humans needed a savior. So he sent his perfect and holy son to live a blameless life and then to be tortured and beaten and hung up on a cross for you and me. God is worthy to be worshiped because of all of that. But are you willing to worship God because of all of that? Because I am, but that's something that you have to decide in your heart. That is something you have to come to know and you have to be willing if things fall or if things have fallen, to recognize that our God is still good. Can I have the band come up here, please? I love this. You know what Job's final reaction after all of this? After all of this chaos, and he doesn't know what's happening. He doesn't know what the future holds. He doesn't know if he'll ever get anything back. 
He doesn't know that something's going on in heaven and, and, well, between God and Satan and there's this interaction. He has no clue that his actions are glorifying God. And he responds in Job 42 with this. He says, I had heard of you, Lord, by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Let me paint this picture. He said, I had heard of you with the hearing of my ear. He said, I'd, I'd read your word. I'd known, I'd been taught. I went to all the church camps and I, I did my devotions and I followed you and I, I knew you because I had studied you. But now the way I know you is different because I see you. Let me paint this picture. You can come up here and you could hear these words that I'm saying and that every other pastor preaches. You could go to family time and read those words. You could do devotions and you can know the Lord by the hearing of the ear. But it's when you come up here and you worship the Lord and you say it doesn't matter what you, what you give me or what you take away. I'm gonna worship you. It doesn't matter if I get everything that I want in my future, if I get none of it, I'm gonna worship you and I'm gonna praise your name. It doesn't matter if, I, if that person I like or that sport I like or that career I want or anything that I want happens because God, you are still good and you are still worthy to be worshiped regardless of it all. That's, and you press in and you worship and you let the Holy Spirit come over you, that's when you see the Lord in a, in a greater and deeper and more profound way than anything else. So I want to ask you to respond in this. Have you been worshiping the Lord or have you been worshiping the things he gives? One never changes, and, and the other is not guaranteed. We, we don't know what our future looks like. If you've been worshiping the things that God gives and not God, that's idolatry. And I want to challenge you to repent, to get prayer and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've been holding in high esteem your gifts, your presence, and not your presence, right? Your gifts. And not, and not who you are. But some of you have not even worshiped God at all. You haven't given your life to the Lord and you haven't come to know his goodness. Then this morning, right now, it's not a night meeting. You're tired, I understand, but God's ready to move. God's ready to meet with you here. The leaders want to pray with you. So if that's you, get prayer. But if you just want to enter into the presence of the Lord, gifts aside, blessings aside, just come up and worship God for who God is, the amazing Lord that he is, for, for his character, for, for God's love and, and all those things without the gifts. If you just want to press in and worship God because he is God and worthy, then come do that too. So once again, if you need to repent or if you need to, to give your life to the Lord, the back's open for you. And leaders, please be back there. If you just want to worship, come forward. Let's do that now. Lord, come, Father. Fill this place with your spirit. You guys could stand up. And I pray, God, that you would not let us allow distractions to hold us back. You would not let us come up with excuses Lord, that there would be no incentive big enough to prevent us from doing the things that we need to do right now. God, you know that we know what we need to do. So I pray you'd give my brothers and sisters strength to repent if they have been worshiping your things and not you. I pray, Father God, that you would give those people here today who have never said, I love you, Lord, and I want to follow you. I want to give you my life. If there are people here like that. I pray you give them the strength to go to the back and get prayer. And I pray you would help everyone else worship you. Because, Lord, you deserve 
all of our worship and praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Give prayer now. Respond. Respond the way you need to respond right now. Don't let anything, any price keep you from receiving what the Lord has for you.